Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I'm super happy to have you here tonight. We're about to talk about problems I have with pictures. I am super responsible with pictures I take. I scatter them all over my SD cards, backup disks, cloud backups. Somewhere they are somewhere in compressed form. Somewhere I have only you know some selected pictures. I need a way to find similar directories, the places among my backups which contain similar pictures, um, or in the general case, given a new picture I just took, I want a list of directories or files which are somewhat similar to this picture. So I need to extract certain properties of the picture and put them in a database of sorts. So we can start with some sort of a hashing function, right, which takes the data, which takes the picture, and transforms it into this short, compact representation, which I can, which is more wieldy, I can work with. We know hashing, for example, from the world of cryptography, right? Where we um, take, say, contents of our Git commit and get this very nice short representation, this SHA1 representation. This doesn't work. It doesn't work. Because if I make a small change in my input, the resulting hash is completely different. And it's very important if I'm working with uh, cryptography, right? I want to see if somebody tampered with data I'm sending over or uh, messed something in my Git history. So I need to look for something else. And there is a family of algorithms which uh, answers exactly this demand. They're called perceptual hashes. And they correspond to how we humans percept the world. Small changes in the input result in small changes in the output. And by similar hashes, I mean hashes which differ on the minimal number of positions when they're represented as bit vectors. One example of this family is called phash. You can just get it off the internet under some open license, an open source license. I think it's GPL. You can then take image files, for example, JPEGs, and phash will translate them for you into those short 64 bit vectors. Phash exposes a nice and friendly C API, right? Given a uh, file name and a pointer to a piece of memory where I can store the hash, I will get to zero if hashing was successful. Let's warm up and try to wrap this API with a bit of Rust. We declare an extern function, phdct image hash, and we declare its API using data types we imported from the libc crate. We need to also instruct the linker that in order to link something against this external definition, it needs to reach to the phash library. Having this declaration in place, we can now um, write a simple image hash function, which exposes an API more natural to um, restations. Given as a uh, reference to a string slice, we will get an optional hash. We will create a C string out, to, out of that uh, reference to a string slice, and then in the unsafe block, we will pass the underlying memory to the C function. If the function returns zero, we return some hash. Otherwise, we have nothing to return. Everybody with me so far? Looks good? Excellent. This is enough to wrap it with a bit of um, wrap it with a main function and expose a simple tool, which, given all the arguments on the command line, it interprets them as as names of files, goes one after another, and hashes all the files. In case of any errors, we just ignore them, report an error, and move on. Now I've got hashes for all the files. I can find on my disk. But let's return to the main question. How can I, given all the hashes I have, how can I find similar things which are somewhere on my backup drives in my database of hashes? We know good algorithms for exact search, right? <laughs> Hash table. But we're not talking about exact search, right? We want a tolerance, a window of error. We could use a B tree. But B-tree relies on the assumption that we have firstly most significant and then least significant bits. Most significant at the top of the tree, least significant at the bottom. The problem is it makes no difference in our world where the bits differ. They are equally significant. We need something else. 
And luckily, there is a data structure from the future defined 40 years ago, which solves this exact problem. It's called the BK tree. And it's a tree which um, is guided by certain properties, whose construction is guided by certain invariants. And it can help us answer the question of how do I get those hashes quickly. Let's start with the distance function. Our distance function, expressed in terms of those extra two types, is just an exclusive OR of two hashes, and then we just count all the bits which are set. With the distance in place, we, for the sake of simplicity, s s differentiate between empty and non-empty trees. If the tree is non-empty, it has a node inside, and the node looks as follows. It has a single hash and a collection of children. And now, the invariant is that within a all the hashes we have in a single sub-tree, sub-node, a child of this node, have exactly the same distance to the current hash. It's fairly abstract. I've got a picture for you. We've got the following tree. We've got the main node and two sub-nodes which can be arbitrarily deep. And the rule is, all the stuff on the left is one distant from the top hash. All the stuff on the right is six distant from the top hash. Our hashes are 64 bit long, so we can have at most 64 children of a single node. With the description of the data structure in place, we can move on and try to insert something to such a data structure. Let's start with a function to create a single, a singleton node. Given a hash, I return a node with that hash and no children. Now, given a BK tree, I want to insert something to it. So I take a mutable reference to the BK tree, and everything depends on the shape of the tree. If it's empty, I just replace myself with a non-empty tree with a single hash. Otherwise, I call insert on the node in my non-empty tree. And the insert on a node looks as follows. If the new hash, the hash to be inserted, is equal to the current hash, I'm done. It's there. Otherwise, I have to calculate the distance between the hash to be inserted and the current hash, the hash itself. And then I looked at, look at the collection of my children. And I take the child at offset new distance. If it's absent, I insert a singleton node. And then I recur, call insert on the node I found. Because this is the place which, according to the principle, according to which we build the tree, this is where the hash must belong. And this is enough to build the tree, preserving our constraint. Now let's try to find something inside. Given a reference to a BK tree, I want to find all the hashes inside, which are at most tolerance distant from the needle, and get a vector of hashes for the sake of simplicity. If I'm empty, I return an empty vector. If I'm not empty, I call find on the node, passing the tolerance. This is, I think, most code I have to show for tonight, so no worries. It won't get worse than that. We've got a reference to self and a needle and intolerance. We start with an accumulator and we calculate the distance between the hash to be inserted as between the current hash and the needle I am looking for. If the current hash is within the acceptable tolerance, then I add the current hash to the result. And then I recur into all the children I have doing exactly the same thing. For every single child, for every single hash we can find in a child, add the child to the accumulator. And we can then test this implementation by starting with a mutable BK tree, inserting two hashes into it, and then making sure that only one of those hashes is too distant from the test hash. Well, there is a problem. There is a problem because this for loop is an exhaustive search. It brings me nothing, right? I'm still looking at every single node I have in my tree. 
And in order to optimize this loop, in order to narrow down the search and prune nodes I'm not interested in, we have to look at certain properties of the distance function. Specifically, the fact that the distance function is a metric. And metric, in a mathematical sense, is distance we know from the real world. And it has, for a function to be a metric, it has to satisfy four um, properties. First of all, a metric must be non-negative. Secondly, if a metric is negative, then the distance between two things is, I mean, then things are the same. Metric is symmetric. Distance AB is same as distance BA. And finally, that long inequality at the bottom is something you know from the real world. And it's called the triangle inequality. The direct way cannot be longer than a way through a detour to B. And this is the most relevant property for our BK tree. If we apply the triangle inequality to a needle we're looking for in our tree, we can take this, this inequality in, term, in terms of distances between those hashes the hash in the current node, the needle, and all the nodes in a certain child node, because they're guaranteed to have the same distance. And now if we apply this inequality, I'm not going to bore you with the math, but if we apply this inequality to two edges of this triangle and play around with the math, we end up with a limit, with a constraint for the distance. The distance between hashes in the child node and the current hash must belong to a certain interval or expressed graphically, we have a needle distance, the distance between the current hash and the needle, and give or take tolerance, all of those, all of the child nodes must fall into this interval. And we can now apply this property to the for loop we have here. Everything above the for loop will remain the same. I'm going to modify the for loop itself. The nested for loop will stay the same, but I will wrap it with an if statement. Take a look. We call the inner for loop only if the distance to the to all the children in the subnode satisfies that criterion. And as we saw two slides before, the narrower our margin of error, our tolerance argument, the more nodes we will, we will prune during the search, allowing us to well, save time. And that's it. I'm more than happy to grab a that grab a pen and a whiteboard in that room and go through the math with you after the talk. But for now, I'm the happiest person because this works and allows me to quickly find pictures in, in the database I, I've built using this tool. For example, those two pictures, which clearly indicate that my hands just shake when I take pictures, are 10 bits apart, I think. So if I give a tolerance of 10, I get those two. But funnily enough, those two, which I took three years and 3,000 kilometers apart, are also 10 distant, according to the p-hash metric. But the cool thing is, if I'm not happy with results, BK3 stays the same. I just need a different hashing algorithm. And there is a variety of them to choose from. OK, um, ladies and gentlemen, three things. Firstly. Um, Perceptual hash is a really powerful technique to summarize media content. Secondly, if we have a BK tree, we can um, very quickly search through those metric spaces of our perceptual hashes. And thirdly, a call to action. If you think that BK tree makes sense and you know how to publish crates, let me know because I have no idea how to publish it. 
this is all I've got. Thank you very much for your patience.